Hello. I'm going to just let people filter in for a few seconds before I start. I'm also going to practice. Okay, awesome network. All right, so hello, my name is Sarah. Um, I am a PhD student at UC Berkeley in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department. And today I'm going to talk about sort of a proposed method for auditing recommendation systems, um, sort of like centered around ideas of user agency and content discovery. So this work is really motivated by the application of digital content. Um, so many of us probably interact with digital media multiple times a day, whether it's music, whether it's movies, whether it's videos or news. Um, and the medium of like the digital world is very flexible. And for this reason, there are new possibilities for showing content to people, but there's also new challenges. And sort of as a response to these things, the access to this information, digital information, is often mediated, at least to some extent, by a recommendation system. Um, and because access to information is obviously very important, and because of the prevalence of these systems, it's really important to ask questions about fairness or bias. Are the information needs of the population being met when uh, information is sort of recommended in a personalized way. Um, and there's a lot of ways you can do this, and there's a lot of good work in this space that's been done, but many times we see some kind of tension between personalization and stereotyping, especially when asking questions of bias. So I open up a browser, and I'm suddenly recommended a bunch of videos about knitting. My brother sees all videos about trucks. Like, is that some kind of gender bias? Should I be offended? Well, if I'm a knitter, probably not. If my brother loves trucks, like, the system is working as intended. However, if my interests started to shift and if my behavior started to shift, I would hope that this system could recommend me trucks. Or if my brother started becoming interested in textiles, it would be able to pick up on that and show him knitting. So what I'm saying here, what I'm trying to motivate is really a question of what can happen within a recommender system rather than necessarily what will happen. And this is an interactive property of the system itself. It's not static. And so really what I'm asking here is by changing system inputs, this is going to be a preference history. Really, we're going to talk about ratings of sort of different items in the system. How can I change the outputs, so the recommendations that are given to me? Um, this is very connected to ideas of recourse. And I think a few times in this comments already, we may have discussed them, often in the um, context of consequential decision making. So, does somebody get a loan? In this case, we sort of have one decision, yes, no, and it's sort of obvious that why somebody would want to switch that decision. Um, recommendation is like a much larger system. There's a lot more possible outcomes, and so it's not quite as clear, clear cut. I'm still going to try to motivate an idea of recourse, but I'm going to do so using a notion of reachability. So I'll make this a little bit more formal. Um, the reachability <laughs> problem is going to be defined for every user and every item in a system. And the problem just asks, can I find some new rating vector of items uh, in some permissible modification set of my existing rating, so who I already am, such that a particular item will be recommended to me? That's the question. Is it possible? Um, so can I find some inputs to get a particular output? Um, now, an item I'm going to define is reachable by a user if this problem is feasible, if it's possible. Um, of course, on its own, it's not really that interesting. Like, if there was one item that I wanted to see, I could go to a search bar, type it in, and find it. Um, so it's really the population idea of reachability is that's something I want to ask about. What's the set of possibilities that are open to me? Um, and so there's a lot of ways you could try to do statistics on this idea of reachability, but I'm going to present a very simple one, which is I'm going to define as the amount of recourse that a user has is the percentage of items in a system um, that are reachable, or percentage of unseen items, maybe. So uh, this is potentially a very like, difficult task to compute this. Uh, recommender systems have many items, many users. Doing this problem over and over again could be very computationally intensive. Um, so in my work, I found a way to sort of computationally efficiently perform this audit for a large class of models. So uh, recommender systems work by sort of predicting preferences of users and then sort of using those preferences to select some items. And so they depend, the reachability of an item will depend on the preference model. Uh, linear preference models are actually a very wide class and they include a lot of uh, common methods in collaborative filtering like matrix factorization or item similarity. Um, and so I'll just sort of give you the down low about what actually happens here. Um, 
under this type of model, the recourse that a user experiences is determined by two things. Uh, one is just the geometry of the model parameter, so the model as a whole, the way that items are modeled within the system. And then two, sort of the span of modifiable ratings. So depending on how we consider possible user actions, um, there's some notion of user control input um, that is determined by the modifiable rating. So these two things, just by looking at the geometry of sort of this model, we can now determine what kind of reachability does this model present. Um, and so I, we can perform this model. I'll show an example on the Movie Lens data set, which is sort of a widely used baseline. Um, it consists, it's a Movie Lens 10 million data set, since there are a few of them. It has 10 million ratings of 10,000 movies by 70,000 users. Um, it's a fairly large set, and it is a common benchmark in rating prediction. I'm going to examine a few state-of-the-art matrix factorization models um, that have varying latent dimensions. So that just means different model complexities. Um, and I'm just going to consider the simple case of top five recommendations. So I predict what users might like of what they haven't seen yet. I pick the top five predictions and say, here's some movies you might like. And so under this model, what does the reachability of information then look like? So I'm going to sort of do two different settings. In the first one, we can consider modifiable ratings as a rating history. So here, this is sort of like I'm going back through my Netflix rating history and sort of changing all my ratings as I've like updated who I am as a person. Um, we can ask if this is realistic or not, but sort of under this model, we can now look at the amount of recourse provided by models as they have different complexity. On the vertical axis here is the recourse provided to users. On the horizontal axis is the complexity of models. And I'm plotting in different colors two different groups of users. So one is users with short histories, um, and one is users with long histories, so who've rated a lot of movies. And we sort of see this very different behavior, that users who have rated many movies, the higher the model complexity, the more recourse we can say they are provided by the model. Um, on the other hand, if, if someone has not rated very many movies, they are actually given less recourse as model complexity increases. So maybe to isolate these effects or try to figure out what's happening, we can also look at a different model of behavior where you know, you're not actually going to go back and look at all the things you rated. Like You don't do that. Like You're just going to react to the five new things. This is how you interact with the system. This is how you might explore new content. Um, in this case, we actually see that both users with uh, long and short histories um, have less recourse as the model complexity increases. Um, and we even more interestingly see, at least in some of the cases as a general trend, although sometimes the difference isn't that large, is that users who have rated fewer movies actually have more recourse under this model. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I just want to highlight three takeaways from this work. Uh, the first is that we can do this audit based on a whole range of possible input and output pairs um, in a computationally efficient manner. <coughs> Second, by doing this audit on some state-of-the-art preference models, we see that we can inadvertently obscure a large proportion of the content base to many of the users in this way. And then lastly, I actually think that some of what I presented raises more questions than it answers. And I'd like to highlight that understanding these interactive and dynamic properties of algorithmic systems is, I think, really important. Um, both from technical and social and legal perspectives. So, thank you.